morning. So maybe we can start with completely different exam type of examples related to visual tracking. So maybe I can show you some example of how you design different models. Because so far we said like, oh, somebody gives you a model, right? Or somebody tells you what the model is, somebody estimated that model somehow, magic, whatever. And then you're working with matrices A, B, C, D. Somebody gave you matrices A, B, C, D. Then you can design a controller, you can design Kalman filter, you can design whatever you need for your system to stabilize it. You need to this particular performance or whatever you need. But the point is that you don't know where even to take that matrix A, right? So you, somebody gives you that matrix A. So today maybe I will switch gears a little bit and I will connect it to Kalman filter as well, but I will talk more about modeling and talk more about like where these matrices could come from in physics or some other domains, okay? So we will talk a little bit about that type of things. And then I will, if you'll have enough time, I will start showing how you get numbers into the formulas, into Kalman formulas, and how you estimate the actual state for very, very simplistic physical example. Okay, so this is plan for today, just to show you how visual tracking works. And it's a little bit different from regular Kalman filter, but very similar. I mean, you can use the same formulas, you can use the same approach, same type of modeling. The terminology is a little bit different, okay? So we will call the same thing with different names, okay? It's just because in that field, if you go to visual tracking, this is how they will call things. It's just renaming variables with other names. Unfortunately, you need to be aware that in math, many things are having dummy variables, right? So like in integral, you can do the D like integral of something dx, or you can do the dt, or you can do the d alpha, or you can do d, d whatever. Okay, a dummy variable. You can call it whatever. But different books, it will call it different names. So you need to be aware so it doesn't matter really. So I will show you other representation of the same thing that you will be just aware that you have multiple options here. Okay, but they're all the same practically. It's just different representation of the same thing. Okay, so previous time we discussed what Kalman filter is, which is optimal linear observer, right? And for that optimal linear observer, we want to estimate some hidden states. And we got to the point that you have recursive solution to that, which is that complex list of equations. Technically speaking, I'm using that thing like LK, if you pay any attention, it's not really used anywhere. Instead of LK, I can put AK here, right, in that formula. And then you don't really need LK. It's not used anywhere else in the formulas, right? So you do not have any L here. You do not have any L there. So you do not really need it. I'm using that only to show you that this is kind of equivalent to observer. Okay, In observers, we are using L gain. And here we are using K gain, Kalman gain. Okay, so, so you have relation. It's not direct, but you have through that multiplication, you have a relation between observer's gain and Kalman gain. Okay, but you don't really need that formula. You don't need to compute it really. Okay, because you just can replace that L gain here. And, and that's it. So, so you're replacing that LK with AK, and that's it. And you don't need Actually, six formulas, you need only five formulas, technically, okay? More than that, you can pay, pay attention that this thing, which sits here, right, that formula, is exactly that formula. So technically, this one is A, P, K plus A transpose, right? So you do not need to recompute that again, that part again. You just put in P, K. So, so you can simplify these formulas. And that's why I'm saying there are so many different variants of Kalman filter formulas, they all equivalent, but they give you like more convenient recursion sometimes for particular cases. Sometimes you want to represent it that full way, sometimes you want to compute it separately. So, so it depends on that, you will have all kinds of representations. And another representation is when instead of covariance matrix, you're using inverse covariance matrix. So 
that, that solution will be also alternative solution, and we will see how this works. So here is the overall summary of previous lecture. Okay, so we've got all these equations, five equations, and we just run them in the loop. Again, instead of gain of ln originally using k directly, okay? So it depends on how, how you define these things. So you start with Kalman gain, computing that Kalman gain, given a priori information and a priori covariance of error, which you decide on. Practically, you say, my P0 minus matrix will be, for example, identity matrix. My X0 will be zero or whatever other vector you decide on, okay? You can select it from Gaussian distribution, random Gaussian distribution with particular values, okay? So given that K, you can compute that formula, which is XK plus, which is measurement update. And for that, you need to know the actual measurement Y0, one, two, three, the actual measurement from your sensor. Okay, this provides you with that plus, x plus. Now you can use covariance of matrix of covariance computed like that. And then given x plus, you can compute the next predicted step. Like what would be the step for k plus one for the x, x estimated at the next step. And then you are doing that in the loop. So it's some sort of for loop, like in programming, right? You're repeating that recursive loop all the time for each k. So k is changing by one. And then here k goes to k plus one, practically. This arrow means that this xk plus one becomes xk at that stage, okay? And then you continue like it was taking like value from the previous step. Is it clear what the diagram is showing? So this diagram practically saying for each k, for k equals from zero to infinity or whatever, whatever last step you choose, you just run in that loop. But you have also alternative Kalman filter solution. And here is why. The problem with that approach is that original P0 matrix, if you have no information whatsoever about your variation, like you have no idea on, on initial state, and typically this is what you have. You have no idea about where your initial state is. How would you choose that matrix P? P is the variance of that initial state, so technically it should be infinity because it could be anywhere in space. You can't decide on a particular point which is more likely than some other points, right? Other states. So you need to choose that your state is such and such, mean of that thing. But you have also some uncertainty. It could be here or it could be there, so you don't know anything about that. Like if you know something, you can use a previous approach. But if you don't know, then P becomes infinity matrix. And obviously you cannot use that in that loop because you will need to multiply by that thing. So if you, you multiply by a huge number here, even not infinity, like huge number, big uncertainty, okay? That entire thing will become pretty huge, which means huge Kalman gain. Now, numerically it becomes less stable. Numerically it becomes less reliable. Because if you multiply and getting some huge numbers and then they manipulate some other systems, some other formulas, you get numerical errors in your computations, more like stronger numerical errors. And this might be a problem for your computation. So it might converge very slowly, if converging at all, things of that kind. So numerical problems. And this is why you have that alternative solution, which instead of P, you are iterating on inverse of P. Okay, so inverse of infinity would be something very small, close to zero, which is much better for numerical computations, closer to zero, right? So instead of assuming P zero infinity, okay, and using that directly, we can use just P zero inverse equals to zero. Okay, and that's it. And this will be just zero number here, that's okay because that inverse is available now. It's not infinity anymore. Here you would kind of need to, to use infinity in, in this case, okay? Here is different. You're just adding that zero plus whatever that constant is, okay? And you get your new estimation for PK inverse, which is, again, inverse of the matrix. So instead of loop with direct P matrices, covariance matrices, 
you are estimating inverse covariance matrices, and they are everywhere here. Okay, so so you can just inverse of that matrix will give you that pk plus, and then you can use it in this formulas here. Okay, so it's kind of helping you to avoid the the initial initialization problem in many cases where you don't know much about your process. Any questions on that? So this is completely alternative Kalman filter algorithm, which is doing exactly the same thing, getting you good values, but gets you better startup point. Okay. So now let's talk about tracking in general. So visual tracking or not visual tracking, it doesn't matter that much. You can have sensorial tracking of some kind. So you're tracking some object and this object is moving somehow in space. Okay, it could move in one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. Okay. And you need to identify different things about that object. And these things might be its location, velocity, acceleration, shape, size, you name it, whatever you want to know about the object. Okay. All of these variables will be your hidden state variables. Some of them you can measure directly with sensors, some of them you can't. For example, I don't know, if you can put accelerometer on the object, then you can measure directly acceleration. But if you have only distance sensor, then you can measure only location, right? You cannot measure acceleration without accelerometer. And depends on the price that you need to invest or even physical ability to put accelerometer on the object. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes the object is so tiny that you cannot even put anything on it, right? So you can measure remotely the distance to that object, but not really acceleration of that object. But on the other hand, you can compute acceleration from the distance as a function of time, right? So it's second derivative of distance is acceleration. First derivative is velocity, and second derivative, acceleration. So this is physics, right? Mechanics. So you actually can compute acceleration without measuring that directly. So this state is hidden. You still want to know it but you cannot measure it directly for whatever reason. Same thing with size, for example. You can estimate the size of the option, but you cannot measure it directly, maybe. You, you do not have any actual measurements on the object. So you do not have that variable. And this size might change in time, for example. You might have object which is inflating, let's say, or the other way around. So you want to know the size, or volume, or whatever you want to know about that object, but you cannot directly measure that volume or size. So this will be hidden state. But what you need to know about that object is how that state is changing in time. So you need to have some sort of model to think how the development is going. And for different types of changes, you'll have different kinds of models. And this is what we want to talk about today, how you pick very simplistic models first out of all possible models. And in most cases, all of the nonlinear effects and all of the sophisticated changes in the object could be included as noise, which is very convenient when you're using Kalman filter, which means you will assume linear dynamics for everything you're modeling. And then all of the nonlinearities and all of the disturbances and all of the actual noises will be that noise component, whatever it is. Okay, so everything which we do not know and have uncertainty about, noise, okay? And obviously stronger that overall noise is, which means how different your real system from linear system will affect the performance of your Kalman filter. So farther away your actual system is from the real system, from, from the model system, worse your results are in estimation. But it's expected, obviously, right? It's, not a big surprise, I guess. Okay, so we have measurement, let's say distance, and we cannot measure anything else. This will be our output. An output could be like one or two measures, could be multiple measurements, could be multiple outputs, right? But typically we are using single output, like distance or something like that. Um, and others cannot be measured directly. Also, at each time state, it, each time step, the state will change from k minus one to z to k, which is a little bit different from the writing that we used before, which was from k to k plus one, which means it's already shifted by one. 
for whatever reason, I mean, I know the reason actually, but in literature on visual tracking, you will see movement from previous time point to present time point. So your K plus one is now, okay? This is the terminology that they're using. So it's like shifted, everything is shifted by one sample back. You just need to be aware of that, that formulas are used with one time point shifted. Is it matter for us? No, really, it doesn't matter. Why? Because you can always, this is linear time invariant system. So it doesn't matter if you start with time zero or time 55. It will behave exactly the same way. This is time invariant system, right? So your zero point doesn't matter where you choose it. So all of that will be equivalent. And all of the K zero, one, two, three, it's not time. So people use even T instead of K. So people frequently use actually variable T instead of K. But T takes value zero, one, two, three, four, five. Obviously, this is not time. This is a sample number. Okay, it's point number. So k equals to one might be t equals to 0 0.1 second or it could be 25 seconds. It could be anything. It could be any time. Depends on your sampling interval. So you need to know sampling interval to know what k equals to five means in terms of times in seconds or minutes or hours, all right? Because this will tell you like where this, this point is in time. It's just sample based on the sampling interval. Technically, t will be equals uh, equal to n or k times sampling interval. So you need to multiply them, right? Any questions on that? How you convert from k to actual time? So this goes on the time scale, right? You have this is t and k at the same time. So t is continuous and k starts at zero. One, two, three. And then you need also to know what is T, which is sampling. Let's say it's five seconds. You're sampling once in five seconds, or it could be five milliseconds, so it could be whatever. Okay. So you're just sampling, which means you're checking these dots at particular times. So this means K equals to these numbers, T equals zero seconds, Five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and so on. You just multiply by capital T less to get the actual time. And we want to recover, as usual, hidden state x of k, which all observers do. Um, and we will use something which is called hidden Markov model diagram for that. This hidden Markov model diagram is popping up in multiple different domains. A lot you will see the, of that kind of thing you might see in machine learning, artificial intelligence in general. Uh, you have that in language models, you have that in controls, you have that in visual studies, you have that in million of different things in all the estimation theory. So anywhere you want to estimate some state, you will see diagrams of that kind. They're not different from what we've seen before. I just want to connect it, that if you see that type of diagram, and sometimes you have like X1 goes also to X2, and you have all kinds of other interconnections for newer algorithms and newer connections, and they have all these states connected to outputs. That's a very simple thing, actually. It's not really even adding much information to that, but it's graphical representation of what observers do. So you have some sort of state X1, which you cannot directly measure, right? But based on that state, you can compute Y at that particular time point. Given next state, you can compute the next Y and so on until you get to any state. Now, each state, dependent on the previous state alone. So you do not have any arrows coming from X2 to XK, for example, right? You have error only from the previous state. And this is called Markovian systems. So Markovian assumption, it's Andrei Markov proposed that type of model many years ago. He was a mathematician, statistician. Um, so he proposed models where the next state dependent only on the previous state. 
this is Markovian system. Just I'm talking about terminology here. So if you will hear Markovian assumption or Markovian system, this just means that you have next state dependent only on the previous state, this Markovian system. And this is exactly what our state space is, right? So all state space systems are Markovian systems because they assume that next K value for X for the next K dependent only on the previous one through the matrix A, right? You have that formula. This is how it works, right? So all of the next states dependent only on the previous states and not like k minus one, k minus two, k minus three, all of the history. Okay, so you don't need to know all of the history. Everything is included in that state. So that's it. This is Markovian system, and this is why you have only one arrow. Sometimes you'll have non-Markovian systems where x1 will be connected also to x3, for example. So it will you need to know the history of x1 and x2 to compute x3, right? Then it's, it's not Markovian system, but we're working only with that type of systems. So observer helps you to take all of these y values and to compute x values given y and u, and you decide on the input, right? So this is just terminology for Markov systems. Okay, so let's start with the most basic model. Okay, and this model is called randomly drifting points. It could be in space, it could be on a single line, it could be in any number of dimensions, technically speaking. Um, so, do you know the name of that type of random drifting? Like at each random point, it will just choose random direction and go there. random distance, random direction, Gaussian distribution. We have multiple names for that thing. In multiple domains, people call it different names. Very famous name, actually. What kind of motion is that? Physics, a little bit. This is Brownian motion. Have you heard about Brownian motion? Like speck of dust in the water. Like if you put like really, really, really tiny speck of something in the water, it starts to move like randomly. Like under microscope, you're looking under microscope on tiny speck of like not leaving speck of dust, right? And starts to move suddenly. Why? Like you put microscopical piece of something, like some dust, like how it can move? Why should it move? Isn't that supposed to be like stationary if you have no wind, no other disturbances but it is kind of moving randomly like that looks like that that kind of moving this is like if you're taking particle in the water it will move that way randomly choosing directions and moving in all kind of directions so technically molecules of water hitting it from different sides okay and just because it's so light it just moves because of this kind of balls hitting it from all kinds of sides right so it's moving randomly and since it dependent on temperature it dependent on all kinds of things like how fast it will move and so on but it still will move like brownian motion now simplistic model for the brownian motion is something like that so this model means that you have next state, and let's think about one dimension first. So let's say P is like scalar, right? So it's a scalar function. 
which is one dimension, okay? One by one, P of K. So next P of K equals previous P of K. Let's say this noise is zero. What would you get? So what is that model? PK equals PK minus one. And this is your state. And P is for position. So your next position equals to your previous position. What does it mean? Mm -hmm. Physically, what it means. Hmm? Yeah, you're not moving. You're stationary. You're not moving anywhere. Okay, you're standing still. This is what it means, right? This is exactly what it means. I mean, your next position will be exactly your present position. You're not moving anywhere. So this is a model. PK equals PK minus one. This is keep your position. But then you add some noise. And this noise is Gaussian random noise, which means that your position is your present position plus minus, and this is like zero mean, right? So it could go left or right randomly. Depends if you will get negative number or positive number from the Gaussian. And it could go very short. It's more likely to go short distance because Gaussian is bell-like shape. But it could go also big distance if you get big number for whatever reason. Okay, Less likely, but possible to get one million, for example, to go to the right. So it will be completely random cheater like that. So, so it will start moving left. Sometimes it will start moving right. Okay, but it will be doing all this zigzags left and right randomly. Okay, because each time you will generate completely random positive or negative number compared to your present position. So your present position might start here, for example, and then you will drift somewhere with all the zigzags, drift, drift, drift. Then you can return back, then you can go some other places. Technically, if you have enough space, on average, you will not get exactly to the same point back. Like, why would you? You will get farther from that point somewhere randomly. And sometimes you'll get drifting back, maybe even more than you started with. So it's completely random movement, Brownian motion. Like in two dimensions, it will look like that. So if P is vector of two numbers, like position one and position two, okay, X, Y coordinates of the position, then you'll get exactly the same thing. But each coordinate X and Y will move randomly. So you'll have all kinds of weird things like that. So you'll have going that way, that way, that way, that way, kind of different distances, different random directions. Right? This is how, how Brownian motion works. So this is that simplistic model, and this is called constant position model for natural reason. Again, position is obviously not constant, but everything which is not constant is included in noise. This is the thing that I started to talk about, okay? So you're assuming that your object is stationary, it's standing still up to a noise. And noise is your tolerance, uncertainty, disturbances, whatever, everything else, which is not standing still. All right? This is that simplistic model. Another model, constant velocity. As you can guess, your object is moving like that. It's constant velocity. It's constant velocity. It's like every single jump in sample time is exactly the same, ideally. But it's not really ideal because, well, your model might be not precise, so you might have some noise in it. So it's constant up to noise, which is your tolerance of your model. More than that, if you measure these distances, for example, for the constant velocity, you might have measurements like that based on your sensor tolerance. So the sensor is also not perfect. Right? So this is the real states, like how it really moves, this is like stars, okay? And circles are actual measurements for each one of these points. So you have that real state and you have measured state, which could be somewhere else, okay? And this is exactly what Kalman filter helps us to resolve. So you have model which will tell you, these are the states and model obviously will not have any noise. So model will be ideal, right? It will have it will assume that your velocity is changing 
at equal intervals, like your distances should change equal distances, right? Between the samples. This is what your model will assume. This is your constant velocity model. But the reality is that it's not exactly, because you never have exactly constant velocity model. And on top of that, all the measurements that you'll be doing on the model are also not precise and not accurate. So you'll have measurements like that. So here's how we write that type of model. So all the Greek letters will tell us noise, okay? So I will use Greek letters to describe noise, noise terms. So now we define that xk vector as position and velocity, because this is all you want to know, and you need to know velocity to predict the next velocity. So for position, we have kinematic equation, and kinematic equation means that your next p of k equals your previous p of k plus delta t times velocity. Remember that formula? So it's like from physics, you have that x t equals uh, f zero plus delta t times v, t v. It's not delta t in that case. It's actual t for continuous case. Okay. So at particular zero time, you will have t equals to zero, so you'll have x zero. So start with x zero, right? For any given t, you should move exactly t times v because this is distance computation, right? So it will be at that point plus your initial position, given constant velocity. And v will be constant in that case, all right? So this is your technical model, and this is a sampled variant of the same thing, plus noise. So this is a tolerance that I'm talking about. So we don't know exactly that this will be constant, but maybe you have some sort of add-on or nonlinear behaviors or whatever it is. This is included all in the WK noise. So delta T is that sampling interval that you have in that case, which we call also TS. All right. So your next P will be your present P times sampling interval times velocity. It's like how far you need to go given that your velocity is constant between the samples, right? Plus some uncertainty or noise. This is your model. This is how you model it. VK in that case is constant based on the model, right? So next VK should be equal to the previous VK. This is exactly what it says. VK equals VK minus one up to some noise. Again, is it really constant or eh, constant, you know? Not exactly constant. So this is not exactly or your uncertainty about how constant that is you are including in that variable, okay, which is noise. You can write that same system of equations as a matrix equations, like state space, regular state space equations, which would be xk equals a times xk minus one plus some noise. So what is that a that you need to use here? So coefficient of pk minus one, which is previous state is one. Coefficient of second variable is delta t, so it's delta t. Okay, so it's one times pk minus one plus delta t times vk minus one. So it's the second term and plus that noise, which will be vector omega and c or whatever that variable is. Do you know what's the name of that variable in Greek? I think it's c maybe. No, this is not epsilon. Epsilon is just that kind of, but with all kind of other things, it's different letter. Um, all right, so practically speaking, this is your matrix A. So this is how you design matrix A. In previous case, matrix A was actually very simple, right? Matrix A was just one. Very simple. And if you want like more dimensions, like uh, P in one direction and P in other directions, then it will be just identity matrix, right? Because previous state equals to the next state. 
But here, this is the matrix that you get. What is your measurement? It's C times X. Let's say you're measuring only P. If you're measuring only P, then matrix C will be one and zero, which means it's one times P plus zero times V plus some noise which you have in the section here, okay? Any questions on constant velocity models? And many different things you can assume as constant velocities, even if they are not, okay? If you know that this is not constant acceleration or some other super sophisticated different things, most people for most mechanical motions would choose that particular model. Constant velocity is the most popular model for almost everything. Because you always can assume that all the uncertainties and noises will come into the noise section. So you don't care how they behave, really. Okay. Okay, constant acceleration model, which will look like that. So each next jump will be larger than the previous one. This is the idea of constant acceleration, right? And your position will be like parabolic of some kind as a function of time, okay? And this is the model, becomes more and more sophisticated. So now you have position, velocity, and acceleration. And if you're going backwards, acceleration is constant acceleration. So assuming your next AK equals previous one plus some noise, same thing with velocity, which will have the same kind of formula like here, if you remember from physics. So next velocity will be previous velocity plus T times sampling. Um, okay, sampling times that acceleration, which is constant. Okay, so V equals V0 plus TA. This is the formula, kinematic formula, plus some noise, which is our uncertainty about that model. And position is PK minus one, which is previous position, plus that thing times V, plus some other noise. This is epsilon, actually. So pay attention that this will be same equation. You can write the same equation. If you put that VK here, okay, you will get PK squared. Um, do you remember kinematic formula for the distance as a function of acceleration? So it was something with the P squared, all kind of formulas like GT squared divided by two for constant acceleration of gravitation, that kind of stuff. So the distance as a function of falling object is GT squared divided by two. Remember something like that? We will just use that formula today, so to remind you. All right. So. In matrix form, the same equations could be written like that. So you'll have delta t, delta t here, one on the main diagonal, multiplied by that thing plus vector of noises. This is not like single number, it's vector of noises. This epsilon, c, and eta, or whatever. Um, measurement, same thing. You have zero, which you're measuring only pk, not measuring velocity or acceleration. And then you multiply by that vector plus some noise, which is random Gaussian noise. Any questions on that? All right. So what are the problems and restrictions on that type of modeling? Again, you can use these models almost for anything. These three simple models used almost for any mechanical or many times electrical models, all right? But many interesting cases do not have that type of linear dynamics and they switch direction, for example, in the middle. And this might be a problem. For example, walking. You can change direction when you walk, okay? Or bouncing ball. So ball is going in a particular direction. It looks like a parabola because you have gravitation forces, right? So it's constant acceleration, which is pulling the ball down, constant force or gravitation, but then it bounces back, right? And you get another parabola that's going in opposite direction after it hits the ground. So your prediction mechanisms do not have any coping mechanisms with that for, for that type of case. So this is kind of a big problem with all these things. Because look, if you try, for example, to predict that with constant acceleration models, this is what will happen. 
So your model prediction, model prediction will be that prediction, for example. So you know direction, so you're throwing ball that way. The ball is supposed to go on ballistic trajectory. So we know that physics of ballistics and like how the parabola looking down should look like given initial velocity that I'm giving to that ball, initial location that I can measure for that ball. I can predict that next sampling point it will be in that red circle, okay? And this will be after I measure the new one, this will be the next prediction, next prediction, next prediction. And obviously they will go farther and farther away from each other because you have acceleration, right? So the distance is growing this time. So what will be the next most reasonable prediction here? Obviously here, I continue on the same trajectory, same acceleration, same object. But the, the real one will be here, okay? Because it will bounce back at that moment. So if your prediction is so far away from your real location or measured location, it's a big problem for Kalman filter or for other algorithms of that kind, which are trying to estimate the actual location of the state because it cannot get that one in completely opposite direction and it's looking for the thing somewhere here. So it could be plus minus some tolerance, but like noise, you know, but it's here, it's like super far away from the actual prediction. So your Kalman will probably give you some value here below the ground level. Okay, this is what your Kalman will give you, estimator of any kind. So you need to be very careful in using that type of approaches. So you have all kinds of corrections for, for, for that type of uh, issues. For example, extended Kalman filter, which is working with nonlinear models. It can switch from one model to another. You have switching models. Uh, you have something which is called JPDAF, which are filters, uh, extensions of all kinds of uh, probabilistic filters, which are capable uh, of doing more sophisticated things, or you have something which is called IMM, interactive multiple models, uh, which are technically very simple idea. I can tell you the, the actual idea, like how you solve that type of problems, for example. So you're assuming that your model can operate in two different modes in that case, continuing going down or bouncing back. These are two states that you can predict. And you run two Kalman filters in parallel. One assumes that you are always going down, that ball is falling down. Okay. Another assumes that you bounced back all the time for each state, for each sampling point. Okay. So one model will say, oh, you continue down. Another model, no, you continue up. Okay. And you run two of them in parallel all the time. So these are interactive models, like interacting models. And when you get new measurement, you say, is my measurement closer to the first prediction or to the second prediction? And pick the model, which is, which is giving you prediction closer to the reality. Okay? So you can switch between the models. And then it will fall down again, okay? And then you will switch back to the first model because uh, the bouncing back model will not give you good prediction when you, again, falling down. Okay, so one model will say, oh, you're going down. Another model will say, you're going up, you're switching between the models. This is IMM approach. So you're running multiple Kalman filters in parallel, and since they are super fast and could be realized in real time, it's not a problem at all to realize it in hardware even, that type of models for tracking. So you have all these multiple models that you can keep in parallel. Uh, you can check physically if you have bouncing back, which means if your height is higher than particular threshold, you can say, well, it's flying back. You shouldn't continue in the same direction, right? You should switch. So you can put that condition somehow programmatically. And here's the models that we will be building now, okay? You have just gravitation falling back, and we will solve also theoretical problem on the same type of uh, physical problem. But here, this is MATLAB implementation of how you do visual tracking of that red ball in computer vision, all right? 
and how you can model that and how you can use Kalman filter for that. This is the problem that we want to solve right now. So let's say you have physical position, which is column and row of the centroid of that ball. Okay, so you have centroid point, which is middle point of that ball in the middle, and it has obviously X and Y coordinates because it's two dimensional space. This is video sequence in something, right? And for each video frame, you can measure where that centroid is, and I will show you how. But this will be our position. It will have column and row at each particular given time. And again, this time is not time in seconds. It's like K, right? Again, I I'm returning to, to the same point. Different terminology, same meaning. That you need to get used to different types of terminologies because you will see it in different places. People just write same thing in different ways. So here is T index instead of K index to to mislead you as much as possible. Okay, but this is how you see that in textbooks on, on computer vision. So you have column and row, and you have velocity vector, which is how fast that thing is falling down, right? It will be V column and V row. Obviously, you will have velocity in X and Y directions, like horizontal and vertical directions. So our position update will be like that. It will be P T minus one plus V T minus one times Delta T. This is ideal model without noises yet. Okay, I'm not using yet any noises. So ideally, I'm assuming constant acceleration model, practically speaking, because this is just falling ball, right? You have gravitational force, constant force, of G, and then I can assume constant acceleration, and velocity will be updated as A times T plus previous V. All right, so far, same constant acceleration model that we discussed before. And acceleration will have two components. You obviously do not have any horizontal component to the acceleration. Gravitation working only in that direction, right? So it will be zero in the column direction, and G in the roll direction. All right, so far, this is our acceleration assumption on the vector A. I will also assume that ball is not inflating or deflating when it falls, which means that the next radius, and I want to estimate radius of the ball for each image. And I assume that it is not changing in time, which means that the next radius equals to the previous radius. So these are my states that I want to estimate. So here is how the matrix will look like. So this is that part, the standard part for the two-dimensional constant acceleration matrix. And the last one will tell me something like that. So the radius, previous radius equals to the next radius. But this is what it says. Now, observation process will be the following. So what can I observe directly? I can observe location of the ball at each frame. I can do segmentation of the ball, find centroid of all the pixels which belong to the ball. And then this will be my column and row coordinates of the ball for each frame. So I can actually visually see where it is at each given frame. And I can measure also size, which is radius, approximately. Not exactly, but I can compute approximate radius from the picture segmentation. I can segment the picture, which means outlining the contour of the ball in each frame, and I can measure approximately how big the thing is, diameter, radius, right? So what I measure directly is that first variable, second variable, and last variable. So first variable is column, row, second variable, and radius, last variable. So these are three things that I can measure. So it's multiple output system. As you see, C matrix, you have multiple rows. And I will assume something on measurement noise, R and Q. Again, previously we called that V and W. Okay, actually the other way around. This is V and this is W. Okay, so this is diagonal matrix. You can play with the numbers here and choose whatever works for you. Why do you think these values are that way? Like why the values chosen like three, 0 0.5 and 10? And I'm not talking about specific numbers, okay? I'm talking about order of magnitude, I would say. Does it make sense or you should change here? 
Like, would you choose it that way instead of choosing just one, one, and one? Like, what should that mean? Like, what is the meaning of these numbers for that particular case? So again, this is my column, row, and radius. So what are these numbers? What is the meaning of the numbers in the measurement noise? This means, this is variance, practically speaking, okay? What is variance? It's like width of the Gaussian. So this Gaussian width is three, this one is 0 0.5, and this one is 10. And we are talking in number of pixels here. These are the units. So three for the column, which is that direction, horizontal direction. So does it make sense to make this thing different from this thing? Yes, why? It makes sense to have them different in there um, because basically as it, as it falls, how it contacts is different. Basically how it was moving in the um, video is going to be different than from one another because when it's falling, it's going to hit, it reacts upwards, it has its own reaction. This is just measurements. This has nothing to do with where it is and how it hits or where it goes. It's like you have single frame. You're just measuring where the ball is. You need to identify the centroid point, which is middle point of the ball, right? So you can do whatever measures you want on that frame, okay? Compute whatever you want. But this says my uncertainty about column of the centroid, which is coordinate of the, of the middle point, is larger than uncertainty about row, of the centroid point. Does it make sense? And? Like, it's changing in the column more than it's going to change in the row. And, but because you're observing it, like, moving through, it's, but it's mainly moving in the column where it's okay. not really moving very much in the row. So on the horizontal, it's not moving much. So do you have more uncertainty in your measurement when it's not moving much? Less, less hmm? it's, less uncertainty. it's going to be less, but it says more. Right? I mean, this is a horizontal variance. It's just wrong. <laughs> This is as simple as that. I mean, these are just practically random numbers that have nothing to do with reality. But when you actually choose them, when you design your matrix, you need to think about the things, like what is the meaning of all of the things? So as you said, for example, when you have this ball falling down, you have some sort of motion blue, right? So it will be probably more prolonged that way because you have like pixels affected from the previous frames because it's moving, you have motion effect from frame to frame. So it will be kind of a little bit prolonged. So you have more uncertainty about actual vertical position versus horizontal position where it will be pretty stable. It will not change much at all, right? Because like falling down on the same vertical direction, right? So technically it should be the other way around. How about radius? Like what do you know about radius? So you will segment that circle and you'll measure radius of the circle. Okay, so you will match circle to the shape of the ball, for example. Sometimes it will be better, sometimes it will be worse. How much worse it could be? Like, can you estimate how many pixels you will be wrong given resolution of the image? Technically you can. So based on that, you can decide like what number should be here. Like what is your actual variance of your noise? So you can estimate that much better than these numbers, given your understanding of the problem. 
it's very important that you will understand the problem and what these numbers mean for you, okay? Now, will these numbers interact? Sometimes they will. But let's say it, it might fall that way for whatever reason, okay? So they are pretty correlated, these numbers, right? You have cross variance, cross covariance in that sense. So, so you need to put these numbers as well. It is not completely independent, right, statistically. All right. And then you can also play with that number, which is system noise. Like, what, what do we know on the all the things in terms of, like, how, how good our model is, like, on the noises that you add here, okay? And it depends on how much your camera is good and so on. So here's how you actually do that. So technically, you start with just reading that video sequence. You don't need all these details. I'm just explaining the steps that you're doing that in computer vision. So you're reading that video. You are making mean of all of that, all of the frames just to get background. And then you're subtracting background to get that type of image foreground mask or the ball for each frame. So you're taking each frame and subtracting background. And then you get that type of image. You're cleaning some noise from that thing. You're defining all these matrices. Your sampling time will be one, but you can define it as actual one divided by 30, which is the resolution of the cameras, typical resolution, 30 frames per second. This is regular. Sometimes you have like 60 frames per second. You have more, but you have high-speed cameras as well. You have all kinds of, okay? But this is like standard web camera, 30 frames per second. Um, and you're defining all these matrices that we defined before, these matrices, okay? So you define all these matrices. You are defining these matrices, R, Q. You're starting with some particular P, whatever it is, some big number. So you have big uncertainty. You can pull that 100, 1,000. It doesn't matter where you start. Better guess you have, faster it will converge. And then you have your initial state. So initial state, you're just starting with the first frame and particular guess for your radius, which would be 15 pixels, for example, right? So it's like 30 pixels, which is your guess. It will change. Obviously, all the states will change as a function of time, and they will converge eventually to whatever you need. And then you have the loop, which is starting from a particular frame where you have the ball start to fall. Um, and you are doing, again, foreground mask will be that thing, minus background, and you getting that thing labeled, picking the biggest object, which is a ball, which is colored by a blue color or cyan color here. Okay. And then you're finding uh, properties of that ball, which is area, centroid, measure axis, minor axis, all kind of properties of that particular object. In the image, again, this is not part of that course, so you don't need to worry about like how you really compute all the things. It's just, I'm telling you, like you actually can compute all of that. All right, you can compute measure axis, like how long that axis, how long that axis is, and they will be a little bit different, right? Or you can compute area of that thing and perimeter of that thing and other things like that. So you can compute radius from that picture, practically speaking, from that segmented picture, okay? And this will give you a radius like that. So if you can see that image here, it shows what was directly measured on the ball. So the circle shows you centroid point, which is at middle of the actual circle. And as you can see, the ball is not exactly that circle, right? You have some motion blue here a little bit. You see that kind of shadow here, reddish type of shadow, right? And at the top, you cannot see it, but it's also kind of having a little bit of blurred shadow because of the motion artifact and camera is not taking pictures very frequently so all the pixels are blurred a little bit smeared in a way okay um i'm sure you saw that effect before when you kind of stop in your video of any kind you have kind of lines where you see like motion right a little bit on the sides so same thing here so it's not exact measurement, but it's plus minus measurement, like good enough for our purposes. And then you just run Kalman filter. So you have that update of prediction, update of the measurement, this time update, prediction, 
same type of formulas that we use for Kalman filter. And then it will give you next prediction. So this is that measurement that we have for that frame. And that green circle shows you where the next one. Okay, this is a prediction, update after update. Okay, so this will tell you also P, but we are not showing it. It's like how likely it is to be here. How confident we are that this thing will be here. So this code is practically tracking the ball in time. And why I wanted to show that, because we want to solve also problem related to that and using Kalman filter, using all the formulas that we developed before. And this is how it will look like, okay? Um, maybe before you go to the formulas, I don't know. Uh, here, again, we have multiple options. I'm publishing all the solutions. We don't need to copy anything or um, kind of to, to follow closely what I'm doing really, but I'm not sure if it is helpful really to show that in class. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you want to see that on board? We can spend all next meeting talking about actually solving by hand some Kalman filter for that example and for some other examples, or we can skip that altogether and then get closer to solving our actual project. What do you think? I think it'd be fun to see one solve, but solve by hand. Yes, but it should be, it also be good if you show us uh, some example of related to the project. So this example is not exactly related to project because in project you will just put the block and this will do that for you. You just designing the filters the way we designed it before. You don't need to do anything by hand. In the project, the only thing you are doing by hand is that first theoretical part where you're developing the matrices. Everything else you can do in metal or simulink. So you're just clicking on the button, it simulates it for you. You don't really need to, to do any of the iter iterations of any kind. You're just defining so, so it's closer to that type of code. It's just you're just writing this matrix so it will compute it for you in for loop, right? So this is particular for loop. You're doing that for each step, and it will do that for you. But in Simulink, you don't need to do even that. You are designing stationary Kalman filter, put that K whatever into your block, and it will simulate it for you. Very convenient. You don't need to to worry about any of these things. You have block of carbon filter. So it's relatively very easy when you don't need to do that directly, OK? You will compute the vector of coefficients, plug it into the system, and see what happens, I guess. All right, so let's see. We will start maybe talking about that thing today, and I will continue next time, and we'll see how fast it goes. Um, all right, so just a few, just to summarize about Kalman filter before we go to solving that question. Obviously, it has multiple pros. It's very simple, relatively simple filter compared to all the nonlinear approaches that people have for control systems. Gaussian is very popular distribution because most natural noises are distributed like bell, bell-like shape. So all of the natural errors that you will get for all kinds of measurements will be probably with zero mean and some particular distribution and more likely to be smaller than bigger, which is natural behavior, right? So if you measure, for example, particular distance and you have like laser pointer, which is measuring also distances or ultrasonic distance measure, whatever sensor, right? So it's very likely that it will have error. On average, it will have zero error, so it's not biased. Right, because non-zero error means that your sensor is biased. It's always predicting, for example, larger distances than it should be. So it's not calibrated. So if your sensor is calibrated, you expect error to be zero mean, which is natural. And also, you do not expect that sensor to provide random errors distributed very widely, which means not like one million meter suddenly as your error, right? So the errors probably will be mostly tiny and sometimes bigger, which means you're talking about that type of distribution, 
which is well defined by Diosin distribution. It also will not be by models. So it will not have like two peaks or three peaks or more peaks, right? So you'll assume that you have average is the most likely one and others are just less likely and you decay to zero very fast at the ends. So this is what Gaussian gives you. So it's very convenient for that thing. Now, update is very simple just by formula, right? So it's all formulaic. You do not need any conditions on that. It just works out of box as is. Um, it's very efficient in terms of real time. You can implement that easily in hardware, multiple carbon filters in hardware, dozen of filters in hardware, no problem at all. It will do that in microseconds, okay? It will compute your estimation. So it's super fast. And it's also very well understood because you have so many works and so many applications and so many textbooks even on Kalman filter. So it's kind of very well researched area and you have all the answer, answers to all the questions that you might have on Kalman filter which is not the case for many other filters, okay? But it has also some deficiencies. And those deficiencies are telling you that if your noise is not monomodal, like single mode, then it will not work. You might have very sophisticated distributions of errors and noises, right? But we cannot handle that in any way. And also linear models are very limited in their way of definition of what kind of motions you can predict in general, right? And yes, you have all of the solutions like IMM and so on, but you have some more sophisticated things happening and you cannot predict all the possible motions or changes in your model, right? Especially if the model is very sophisticated. So this is for that part of Kalman filter. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you.